So my original idea for this video was let's talk about why seven figure book deals are destroying the publishing industry. But as I started to do my research, I realized that, well, I couldn't, I couldn't find what I needed to find just by doing some researching online. I needed to talk to someone who was on that side of things because as an author, I'm totally biased. I only see this half of publishing. So I reached out to a person with several years of experience working on both the publishing and sales side at two or three of the big five houses. This person obviously wanted to remain anonymous and so we decided to make this more fun and entertaining. We would give them an avatar and we decided that avatar should be Andrew Scott. A quick kind of disclaimer, Andrew works in adult publishing and there are going to be some differences between how that works and how imprints that are in children's publishing function. But overall, what we talked about, I think the vast majority of it is going to be applicable to books published for all age levels. Also, I'll say this again later, but Andrew really emphasized upfront that every imprint is different like different ethos, different practices, different budgets, and things can change. And they change quickly. There is a lot of turnover in publishing and staffing is usually pretty tight and one or two key positions changing, it can really change the character and circumstances of an entire imprint. So just try to keep that fluidity in mind. Also, much like my two-part Saving the Middleist video, this quickly ballooned into something much bigger than just one video. And I think it's going to become apparent why when you get to the end. So bear in mind that there is much more to come, but for today in this video, we're gonna be talking about what the sales, marketing, and publicity departments at the Big Five Publishers do, what really goes on in acquisitions meetings when it's decided whether or not an offer will be made on a book and how much that advance will be, and why books sometimes lose support sometime between that offer and the release date. So when I reached out to Andrew, I sent him a whole bunch of questions and he responded via email and we agreed to set up a chat and I realized after I read through all of his thoughts that one of my first questions, and this is embarrassing for me to admit, but my very first question to him had to be to explain to me the difference between the sales department, the publicity department, and the marketing department. Because while I know sales and publicity and marketing are not synonyms, and I could define them as terms, I realized when he was talking about certain points of where the book would be in the process, I wasn't sure which department it would be in. So that's where we started our conversation. Publicists work on getting books earned media, meaning publicity gain through anything that isn't paid media advertising reviews, mentions of books online or in real life, podcasts, YouTube videos, social media, events like book festivals and conferences, setting all of that up, that's what they do in the publicity department. The marketing department deals with paid media, advertising and sales promos, and not always, but often they liaise with the sales department in the house. Andrew pointed out that marketing has changed a ton in the publishing industry. When he first started out, the marketing department was responsible for creating the print catalogs of all the books a house had coming out that season, and that was like most of what they did. Back then, a marketing assistant might spend most of her time cropping author photos for the catalog, or in Andrew's words, it was yearbook staff. Now those catalogs don't exist anymore because digital marketing has changed everything. Marketing directors are in charge of paid advertising, talking to sales, and taking care of how every book looks on the internet, including Goodreads, Amazon, and other retailer sites. The sales department are those workers in the house who are going to retailers and talking to buyers that represent Amazon, Barnes & Noble, indie bookstores, and big box stores like Walmart, Target, and Costco, and pitching the list of upcoming books at the house so that the buyers can decide which of those books they're going to stock. So if it helps 
kind of to think of it in levels. A book starts out in the editorial department once it's acquired. That's where your editor is going to be located in the editorial department. And then it moves up to managing ed. And managing ed is where we have things like production and copy editing and things like that. Next, it's going to go to the marketing and the publicity departments. They do work side by side. Preparing marketing and publicity plans for the book's release. And the marketing people are also liaising with the sales team and kind of like pitching the books to them. And then it goes to the sales team and these are the ones who are going out and talking directly to retailers and they decide where the books are going to be and at which stores and then the book is out in the world. But of course, before all that happens, a book has to go through acquisitions. The acquisitions process can vary a lot from imprint to imprint, but in general, most places do try to get at least a few people from all of these different teams to be a part of the process. So again, this is where the decision is made whether or not the house is going to acquire the book and how much the advance will be and to an extent a marketing plan is decided upon but more about that later the whole acquisitions process is kind of shrouded in mystery so what really goes on what is the secret formula the magic process by which an acquisitions team at a publishing house decides how much money they're gonna give an author for a book. It depends. It depends on the house, it depends on the publisher, it depends on the imprint, it depends on which people are in the room at the time, it depends on the season, it depends on if Jack remembered to bring the bagels this time, it depends on so many things that have literally nothing to do with the author or the book itself. I don't know if chaotic is quite the right word, but that was the word that kept coming to mind as Andrew described this to me. Acquisitions meetings can be really huge and formal and kind of intimidating, but they can also be small and informal and it can range anywhere in between. In general though, they are pretty high stress for editors because they're trying to convince whoever happens to be in the room to make an offer and make it a big offer. In some cases, it's easy enough for editors to make their point. Obviously, more senior editors have more clout, and so it's gonna be easier for them to get the team behind their books and behind whatever advance they want to throw out at this author. Obviously, if the author is established and has a few successful books out there and a devoted following, that's gonna make it easier too. If the book's topic fits with a current trend, if it's something the house has been looking for, that's an easy win. And sometimes the agent will give the editor who will give the team a heads up that the book is already generating interest at other houses. Or the agent will just say, I'm anticipating an offer of this much and kind of give them an arbitrary starting point for the advance. But in most cases, this is just an editor who loves a book and likes the author a lot and wants to publish this thing, going into a meeting and trying to explain a gut feeling to her coworkers. Have you ever tried to explain a gut feeling about something? It's really hard to do. And these meetings move fast, everybody's pitching, so you're talking about a lot of pressure and a time crunch. And again, you don't even know exactly who from which departments are going to be in the meeting. And so you just start throwing things out there and trying to justify this gut feeling that you're having and some crazy things can come out of your mouth. An example Andrew gave me that editors threw out frequently was the author is mediagenic. Mediagenic being code for good looking. Yeah, I don't need to make a list of reasons why this is terrible. But I will add that Andrew said that mediagenic was something he heard a lot earlier on in his career and that thankfully that word and just that way of thinking in general has started to fade and things are changing and it's improving. I wanna give credit where credit is due. Traditional publishing is extremely slow to change, much slower than we would all like, but it is happening. <laughs> and if that comment made you wonder, did Michelle talk to Andrew about publishing paid me? Oh yeah, we talked about it. And if you were also thinking, wow, could these acquisitions meetings be more awkward? Oh yes, they could. Andrew said that there is a heartening desire to see more authors of color published at most imprints. However, 
sitting at a boardroom table and listening to a bunch of white editors try to figure out how to talk about this is, I believe the word Andrew used was astounding. Now again, baby steps, but this is a huge improvement from the days when an author of color's book would be brought into acquisitions and one or two people on the team would reject it and say, oh, the author isn't mediagenic, which we know is code for I am racist. So overall, it's positive to hear that the tides are finally turning here. Andrew said that there are very clearly editors who are deeply invested in bringing more diverse books into their house. And as a result, all of the teams are reading more diversely. And this is reshaping the lists at these imprints to be more reflective of our communities and our world. But yes, there are also editors who are just doing it for the cookies or because it's trendy, which, you know, the reality of the existence of people who are different than you is not a trend, but that's a topic for another video. Andrew also said he gets frustrated in these meetings when editors talk about an author's amazing social media presence as a way of justifying that gut feeling because he said, editors often don't really realize what that means. Like they might say, this author has 200,000 followers on Twitter, but that's all they know, just that number. They don't know if those followers are real people. They don't know how engaged they actually are with the author. And you know, just because people follow you online and they will read your tweets or look at your pictures or watch your videos, which is all, by the way, content they consume for free, doesn't mean they're gonna wanna pay $25 for a hardcover book with your name on it. And yes, we are going to get a lot more into all of this social media stuff later. But can I just say, I felt extremely validated when Andrew said this, especially because the day before this conversation, I deleted Instagram off my phone. Okay, so hearing about acquisitions meetings uh, made me feel as an author like my books are nothing more than scratch off lottery tickets. So that was super fun. Once a book makes it through that process and an author gets a contract and the promise of a certain level of marketing or publicity, it's all gravy, right? <laughs> I gave Andrew a purely hypothetical scenario. An author goes to auction with her book, meaning she has offers from multiple publishing houses and she chooses to sign a contract with the house that promises lead title status, meaning they are going to give everything they've got marketing wise and not always, but usually meaning she's getting a pretty big advance too. Six months in, she still hasn't received an edit letter and her publication date has been bumped seven months and the whole marketing plan and lead title status have been totally scrapped and what, no, I'm not talking about myself. This never happened to me. I'm not doing this just because I'm a bitter ass. From the author's perspective, it can feel like all of that talk was just bait to get us to sign a contract and they never intended to deliver, but I know that it's not really that insidious. So I asked Andrew, when a book support kind of tanks in the house after the the contract is signed, what's really going on? It's definitely not that insidious. No imprint I've ever worked for has ever signed up a book for nefarious purposes. Publishers want to make money, and so if they sign up a book, they think that book has a chance at success. But all sorts of things can change after acquisition, much of it out of control of the author. Biggest on this list, budgets can change. I get an annual budget that's reviewed repeatedly over the year. Sometimes I get more money, sometimes I get my budget cut. An editor might acquire a book when budgets are one way, and then by the time the book is ready to publish, have a completely different financial landscape. I feel like budgets are a big mystery to authors and I do not blame them. For those of us on the ground, they can be a mystery too. The big five are owned by large international companies, which means that the money never flows from point A to point B in a straightforward way. Publishers might post great profits and those of us at publishers might not see our budgets change at all. Another possibility, a little more depressing, is that the book might lack internal support. Most acquisitions of a certain level get as many departments as possible involved, marketing, publicity, sales, but the people from those departments who get involved might make a call that their colleagues disagree with down the line. This is something I see most commonly with sales. A book is reviewed by one of the people at the top of the sales chain. It's purchased for a nice advance, and then when the manuscript is circulated to the rest of the reps, they don't bite. They'll still sell it, it's their job, and the contract has been signed, but if it's the kind of book where you really need a buy-in and word of mouth, you might see plans downshifted. 
And another possibility, similarly depressing, is that the book might lack buyer support. Even if everyone at the publisher is on board, a book might get pitched to a big retailer who just shrugs or says it's not for them and they're not going to take a stand on it. If a book can't get out into the marketplace, a publisher might be less inclined to put money into the campaign. If they do a big ad campaign but people can't find the book at Barnes & Noble, they're not going to sell anything. A book can work without retailer support, for sure, but it's a lot harder to pull off. And I asked him more about the bumped pub dates specifically because that's happened to literally every book I have ever published, and I totally understand that a lot of things, I mean, these schedules are huge and unruly and difficult to manage, but something that has always bothered me is that there seems to be a complete lack of understanding on behalf of the publisher that when an author's pub date gets bumped, it literally lessens the value of her advance. I mean, y'all, $20,000 spread out over 12 months is not the same as $20,000 spread out over 20 months. And Andrew gave me a whole lot of different reasons why a book's publication date might change. One, printer capacity. Scheduling is extremely wild, especially these days. I'm sure you've read about the printer capacity issues. They're no joke. Even before this, time on a printer was hard to come by, and this is happening at a time when print sales overall are up. So we're talking about less printer space than ever in a market where books are constantly in demand. All of the houses are bargaining for space at this one printer, and you can imagine who gets the most space, and you can imagine who gets the second most space, and so on. Two, competitive title. In this case, I mean a book published by a different imprint or house that is seen as a direct competitor for whatever reason, and having a similar pitch or topic is the most common. A book might be rushed to get out ahead or delayed to give the other title time to hopefully fizzle. Three, another book moving into the season that screws up the budget for everyone else. For example, an author with some kind of clout turns in a book early and their agent demands it gets published ASAP and the publisher is unable to talk them out of it so it gets crashed into a season and eats up the budget in such a way that other books are moved so that they can have some budget instead of no budget. I just want to interject here and say on behalf of midlisters everywhere, bestsellers, could you not? You already have so much and we have so little. Four, a capacity issue, either caused by another book or just caused by an overworked staff. For example, a publicist suddenly has too many titles in a month, so they move a book to balance her workload, or production gets backed up and a book needs to move out, or an editor gets backed up and a book needs to move out. Changes like this ideally should happen as far in advance as possible, and a lot of this depends on how well your imprint is run and how on top of shit your editor is. Have I seen editors lie to authors about production being backed up when in fact they drop the ball? Sure have. It's bad form to change a pub date too frequently, in my opinion, but I know other houses have a different approach to this. Five, there actually is a better season for the book. Sometimes there's a time-sensitive publicity promotion available or time-sensitive store promotion available. Sometimes sales requests it. They'll go to marketing and say, I know you have this in May, but my August is a little light right now and I think you'll get better placement then. Now, in my video about the midlist, I brought up this quote by Morgan Entrican. It's harder to publish midlist books now now because a book that's going to sell under 10,000 copies will generate about $125,000, which isn't enough revenue to crank up the publicity machine. And I asked Andrew to explain this because as I said in that last video, shouldn't the publicity machine get cranked up first? Wouldn't a healthier midlist be better for the publisher? The midlist has taken a hit in the last 10 years. I think there's a lot of reasons for it. A big one, and one I don't think gets addressed nearly enough, is consolidation of publishers. This has been happening steadily for 30 years, even before Random House bought Penguin, and one of the big results is large, consolidated sales forces. You might be published by a relatively small imprint with an intimate staff, and you might get great attention from your direct team, and then that team has to turn around and sell your book to a sales force that is getting pitched by every other imprint at that company, all of us telling them, this is the make book, this is the breakout title, this is the author you need to pay attention to. You're not just competing for marketing dollars, you're competing for attention internally. I don't want to denigrate sales. They have incredibly, incredibly hard jobs, and just about everyone I've ever worked with in those departments are passionate, thoughtful readers. Sales reps are by and large the best readers in the company, but they are truly being asked to do the impossible. 
Hand in hand with this is the changing retail landscape and the related question of what really makes a book discoverable. Amazon has clearly changed the game on this, and it's a game that publishers have been struggling to keep up with for 20 years. The amount of time, energy, and resources that go into just keeping our books looking good on Amazon is absolutely wild. A brick and mortar store doesn't ask marketing directors to come through every day to make sure the correct jacket is on the book and that they've put it in the right section and that the flap copy is readable, but Amazon basically does and more. Amazon has also changed the way that book buyers think about browsing and discovery, not to mention creating impossible standards for shipping times and inventory availability. And other retailers have responded either by reducing their shelf space and only trying to sell the top percentage, which is particularly evident in the merch channels, or by trying to make their own bestsellers with mixed results. This has been Barnes & Noble's strategy for the last couple of years. Independent bookstores have been the industry's bright spot for the last few years, but they're obviously facing an incredible economic crisis at the moment and a very, very uncertain future. So figure both of those factors shrink the market. Haven't we suffered enough? Apparently not, because we are also contending with a real drop-off in viable marketing and publicity options. Publicity is a tale told many times, so I won't get into it too much, but books coverage has dropped off significantly in the last 10 years, which means there are fewer places to pitch. And if those places pass, then what? Well, I'd love to say marketing can step in, but consumer-facing marketing that actually sells books is hard to find, but for a different reason. There are more options than ever when it comes to advertising thanks to the digital ad boom, but the sheer saturation of ads that is necessary to sell a product, any product, not just books, is at a budget far beyond that of most publishers. Even high budget book campaigns are nothing compared to what most brands would have to market a new product and imprints have new products every week. I imagine that's what Morgan was alluding to when he used the phrase publicity machine, although I object to his framing of the issue. But this is a thing that differs imprint to imprint. Some publishers will identify their top titles and shove all the budget in that direction. Others will spread it out and then invest more in the ones that succeed. A healthy midlist is easier to have in some places than others. At the end of the day, publishing is a numbers game. And each of these big five houses, soon to be big four, has to publish a certain number of titles a year just to stay in the game. Which again makes me wonder, wouldn't it be in their best interest to give a little more support to these midlist titles and not rely so much on the success of so few books? But Andrew pointed out, and I know that he's right even though I hate it, that from the top, if you're looking at it from a CEO perspective, your business just becomes columns on a spreadsheet. And one column is the amount of money this whole company is allowed to spend on advances. And in another column is the amount of money this whole company is allowed to spend on marketing. And then one column is how much the backlist is earning. And another column is how much the front list is earning. And you mesh all that stuff together and it just doesn't matter where the money comes from. It just doesn't matter. And again, it depends on the imprint and the publisher and the house. If you're a small imprint, you probably have a small budget, but if you have a good year, like a few titles that do pretty well, then the next year your budget's gonna be just a little bit bigger. And it really has nothing to do with the books in your season, it just has to do with how well you're doing overall. You can have a good year with a really healthy midlist, but it's harder. And it takes a lot more resources and it takes a lot more people than it does to break out one big book. And according to Andrew, it's easier to have one or two big breakout books. You can have a good year with a healthier midlist, but it's harder because you need more resources and more people. And that's something that is unfortunately harder and harder to come by. I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of turnover in publishing because there's a lot of burnout in publishing. And according to Andrew, they would rather burn people out than hire more people. And I have to tell you that this scenario I'm about to describe, Andrew is not the first person who has worked at one of the big five to describe this exact scenario to me. A person in editorial or marketing or publicity or sales leaves their position and the boss tells the department yeah you can fill that position in six months and they're like but can we fill it now and the boss says no six months and they struggle and struggle for six months and then six months passes and the boss is like look you don't need that position you've been doing it without that position this whole time and then that position is gone and an already overworked staff just got even more overworked. 
So they don't have the resources to fill existing positions, but they do have the resources to give seven figure advances to debut authors. Something is not right here. And I hope now you're starting to see why I had to split this up into multiple videos because all that, that was the backstory. Y'all, that was the prologue. Andrew and I have a lot more to share with you guys, including who's really making money at the big five, how a lot of this affects self-published authors in the same way that it affects traditionally published authors, and on a more positive note, some marketing advice for authors. And you know what? It's not join TikTok. I'll see you guys with more next week.